Welcome back to Danny Rants. Today I have a special guest who's flown all the way down from Sydney. He has some shows, so I'm putting a bit of mayo on that. But it's none other than Forte or Forte at Large. How are you, brother? Good. How are you? Thanks cool. for having me. Thanks for coming down, man. Yeah. For those that don't know who you are, um, I would say you're a pioneer of a sort of Australian gutter or drill rap or probably not drill, but you know, rap in general. Mm -hmm. yeah. For those that don't know who you are, you are, could you give us like a, a little bit of a rundown? Um, well, I'm an Australian rapper based, from, based in West Sydney. I think I just caught the, there is people before me. I'm not gonna say I'm not the original. There is people before me, but they didn't influence what I do. I'd say I just caught the start of the digital age. So whatever you wanna call that. Um, and yeah, I've pioneered a lot of things, I guess. But um, yeah, um, there, there was people before me, but. Originally you were from uh, Blacktown? From Blacktown, Prospect. And now uh, Western Sydney, when you think of rap, like you think of Australian rap, you think of Western Sydney. Yeah, there, like it didn't exist when I when I started. It wasn't like oh, like I got a my first mixtape was the two one four eight mixtape, which the postcode for Blacktown. And now look at this postcode shit. Like it wasn't my intention, or I wasn't repping it, but it was just like I just had to let people know where we were from. It was actually like looked down on to be from these areas. So I was like, you know, fuck you, cunts. This I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. from Blacktown. You know what I mean? Like, and now it's like. You say you're from West Sydney. I guess it's sort of a cool thing. I don't know. Like it's been what since 2018. It's done that full backflip. The stigma's changed. You know what I mean. So I've, I probably started. I dropped that mixtape in 2006. So yeah. Wow. Really. Yeah. So that's what we're we'll we'll close to 20 years now. So and those artists before you, you like you were kind of working around the same time, but a different scene. Was but there was like you know Hilltop Hoods, Blitz and SO 360. Yeah. They I, were commercially sort of successful. And you were doing the more underground street sort of stuff. So I got I got into the Aussie rap and didn't know any Aussie rappers. You know what I mean? And then and sort of a couple of years later, you would go to the shows and you realize who's who. There was people like Deathwish Cast before me, and I had no idea these guys had done. They'd done film clips in '92 in my area in Blacktown, but you know it, I had to like get in the scene to realize its history because it wasn't really the internet didn't really document a lot of this stuff. I grew up on a, a American rap, you know what I mean? I, I loved my American stuff. That's what I was gonna too. say. So what was your influence? Like obviously the Aussie oh, guys, and you can tell, like listening to your stuff and you know, Cursor and all these other yeah. guys, you can tell that it's not the influence of the original yeah. rap guys. It was Ice Cube, Easy E, Snoop, Tupac, Biggie, just all that shit. Like and I was and Bone Thugs, and I was like blessed years later to work with a lot of these guys that I grew up listening to. So I was never influenced by any Aussie rapper at all. Like it was just I got respect for them, but I don't even really listen to Aussie rap now. Yeah. So it's like each to their own, but you know. So, so when you first started doing it, was it kind of obscure thing to do in Western Sydney? You you were a fucking gronk, pretty much. You know, like no one would really say it to me, but like too big. It's like yeah. Well, I remember like I used to sit in the car park, and I we my mates used to we were hustling from this pub car park, and I'd just be there writing rhymes, and cunts didn't tell me until years later that they're like we didn't. We, know what the fuck you're doing like it wasn't until like 10 years later i got some results and i guess that was the thing it, there was no rewards for being a rapper like yeah. there was no financial there was no status there was no you know what i mean now it's different it can be a career path but it wasn't feasible to really say i'm gonna be a rapper it was almost insanity like yeah i get you, you know yeah. what i mean like <laughs> so i'm so just when you first started writing uh, raps and stuff, you know, you've gone then gone on to like record stuff and yeah. get into a scene and you've done fucking hundreds of shows around Australia. Yeah. What was your first step from riding in the car park while you're hustling? So, so it was open mics and battles. So that was the only way, way you'd get your foot in the door. So I'd, I was doing open mics and battles. I actually started to do pretty good. I won the first few battles I went in, I won like three weeks in a row. Then I started to like meet people got my mixtape together and eventually someone I met in that scene said, hey, would you like to do your own show? And I think it was, I think it was 2006 that I did my first show. And it was at Lansdowne in um, Sydney. Yeah, I know it, yeah. And it was, and actually went really good. Like, I've got the footage of it, I still haven't released it. Like it's just in the archives, but yeah. And then from there I got a bit of a name. I know like, I guess it was the, the changing of the guards or like, you know, the newer cunts were coming up. We, there wasn't much competition as it was, you know? So I think to stand out, it was probably easier back then than it would be today. Yeah, I getcha. Yeah. Yeah. And this battle rap stuff, right? Like, you know, when you originally started, cause now it's, I know it's still around, but it's yeah. you know, not really popular. Yeah. But when you were starting doing that, was it popular back then or was it still N sort of- No, it was, so 
I, I came into the battle rap scene where it was just freestyle. You, you'd have 12, 15 people. You didn't know who you were battling. You had to sort of have a line for each one or t you couldn't really prepare. It was like full freestyle off the top of the head. Then the Got Beef shit came along. That's like the Cursor era where you knew who you were battling in advance. You could write your stuff. You'd have it all prepared. And just as that started to get popular, I was bowing out of that and to do shows. I was like, yeah, I was a bit past that. Yeah. So, yeah. What was it like in those first, you know, before it was the Got Beef stuff and whatnot mm. and people were like sort of throwing fucking insults at each other? Oh, it's, it got heated, right? So, Did it? Like, I, had, yeah. I had to ask this question. Because like there's times, like, I used to go sometimes, like I might go with a, some, a bunch of boys. Sometimes I'd go by myself. Maybe I had one person, two people, but I'd go for the jugular. Like I'm really like, I'm fucking going at your grandma, your fucking ancestor. Like I'm going as hard as I can go. So there's like, there was times when I'd go against like some Islanders and there'd be like 10 of them in the crowd and I'm like, fuck you, fuck your mom. And they'd be like, wait till you get off stage. But like another time over these Mexicans too, they're like, you're gonna let this white boy talk to you like this. But like each and every time I got off stage and they'd shake my hand and I said, you got some heart because you know, in that moment, you just got to let them have it. And it's it's a sport, you know what I mean? It's I not like, you. you're not going to just jab. Did it ever kick off though? Like, because I, I watch people say shit oh, and I'm like, you know, no. especially I, like I've known you before this podcast, obviously. Yeah. But it's like, I know you boys. I can't imagine people saying that shit to you Surprisingly guys. not, you know what I mean? And that's sort of why I didn't continue doing the battle shit because I, you're going to have some like, you know, five foot skinny bloke telling me about my fucking grandma or something like that. Like I, I couldn't see me being around that. It's like I'm very witty and I can be a smart ass, but at that age, I was just more likely to react in a different way. I get you, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you start doing the shows and at that time, who else were you sort of, were your peers? Um, well, I just took anyone that was down. So I had like, I started with Losty, you know MC Losty? Yep. So he was actually the first, he was the only person I knew in Blacktown that rapped. So we used to go to, I used to go to his house, he'd have like an old karaoke machine, we'd download fucking the instrumentals of Napstar, put on a CD, play it and record it on these tapes and practice. So that's how I actually learnt. And he was already, already established in the rave scene. He's still doing work, big gigs to, these day, to this day, you know, doing big stadiums and stuff. So it was like him, then it'll be people like Redback. I, at these battles, I'd sort of gravitate towards the people from the West. So yeah. there'd be like the people from the city and the people from the West. So a lot of those people to this day, I'm still friends with, but I was just like, I wasn't that person that just wanted to be on stage by myself. i would I'd be more comfortable with a group of people. So like anyone, Two Locos or Early One, he's a well-known graffiti artist. He did a lot of shows with me in the early days. Um, yeah, and a lot of people that just came and went over time, you know, Head Hubbard, Too Furious, um, you know. If, if, you, if you wanted to get up and you were down to do it, I was happy to have you there. But yeah, I never really wanted to, I never really liked to be the center of attention. I like to just blend in a bit. I get you. So, and then what kind of like, what, what was the audience and what kind of numbers were you doing when you first sort of started doing this shit? The first show I did, it was, it was probably like 150 people. But like back in those days, Hilltop Hoods were doing like 400. Yeah. So if you did 400, I remember like, I remember Hijack and Torture, they were doing, they were pretty popular. It was like Hijack and Torture and Hilltop Hoods were pretty much neck and neck for who's gonna blow. And then I was thinking Hijack and Torture sort of didn't go the way they, I think, unprofessionalism. Torture is very professional, but like Hijack, I heard stories. I don't, that let them tell their stories, but you know, drugs, alcohol, fucking running amok, being young. And then Hilltop Hood just seemed to have their shit. They're just a bit more. I think they're more like working class. But to, that's the way I see them. For sure, I mean? that's a good one to sort of like transgress into, right? So mm. when you guys were doing that stuff, like they were singing about working class, you know, Hilltop Hoods and Bussinesso yeah. and all those guys, um, and they were singing about like out of suburban problems, like white dude problems. The stuff you're singing about, the content's a little bit more, you know, yeah. deeper, darker. It's not necessarily related to American stuff, but it's the stories of the outer suburbs. Yeah. Um, was that like a challenge? Like being, more, I guess, not more real because their story is their story, but yeah. like your stories were more, you know, violence and-, and uh, It wasn't a challenge because it was a, what was happening around me. It was like easy, if anything, like if you write a song and you know what you want to write about, that's the hardest part. I got the topic, you know what I mean? So like there was a lot of shit going on and I, I only really rapped because the shit I was seeing like culturally, through West Sydney, like the different ethnicities and the criminal elements weren't told in Aussie rap before me, I believe. I to agree. The, to the extent that I was doing it. And it was, 
And I always knew, like, I was just like, once these Lebos or these Islanders really get their shit together, like, and it took a lot, lot longer than I thought it would. And now you see certain backgrounds being bigger in the rap scene than they ever were in those early days. Because I used to be in parks with these guys and there was no shortage of Islander rappers or anything like that. I just think it took a while. West Sydney is very diverse. You know, like you got so many different cultures from African to Aussies to Arabs, to Islanders and all that. And now just is everyone starting to like, you know. Come together. Yeah. But yeah, I, I thought it was overdue. When I started, I was hanging around on all these groups and I was just seeing a lot of criminal elements and a lot of shit that wasn't told. And I just felt like if someone had done it before me and done it well, I wouldn't have even bothered to do it. But I just felt like, you know, this was something I can talk about that hasn't been talked about. And it's sort of weird, right? Because like in America, that was the foundations of it. And then in Australia, it's like, you know, other than yourself, who's been yeah. doing it now for over a decade, yeah. it's only just really started, right? Yeah. But again, like even in Melbourne, I know you talk about that mix of eth ethnicities and shit. Same down here. If you go out the Southeast or you go out the West or North or whatever. Yeah. And again, we don't really have that culture of Western Sydney's created now, yeah. but you know, growing up in the birds like myself, I saw more of the shit that you rap about than I did yeah. about, you know, Hilltop, Hilltop Hoods did. Yeah. But at the time it was like, if anyone tried to talk about that stuff, it was like, you almost got silenced. Yeah, and it was sort of like a thin line between like a try hard or like, it, it, it's really hard to prove you're authentic in that element without giving yourself up or really, yeah. do, you know what I mean? So it's a thin line between like, you know, rappers talk, but crims don't talk. So it's like, how are you gonna, portray this lifestyle so I don't always you know maybe I say a lot more than I should have but I think at times people didn't believe it but you could look back on it now and if you like you if you're from the area you know okay What's going on? Yeah. this is based on a true story this ain't too far-fetched from reality and I think like the difference between Aussie rap and American rap was so great you had gangster rap but there was no gangster rap in Australia. And I'm not saying I'm a gangster because I'm not in the gang, but now there's a lot more of a criminal element and it's accepted. Or everyone's going gang gang these days. You yeah, know exactly, what I mean? yeah. So like, Even people that aren't in them. Yeah, but doing it in my early days, it was like, yeah, I guess it was, you know, I didn't have too many dramas, but it's just like, I, was, I wasn't trying to convince people that I was really, I was just doing it. And yeah, I get ya. And here we are now, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. So. And so when was like, you know, obviously Cursor, which is what, 11, 12 years ago, he blows yeah. up. Your story is, uh, is kind of cold lines with his at the yeah, time. But when do you close. when do you sort of meet him and like, how does that happen? Because that takes it from, you know, Pioneer, 150 venue, yeah. people venues, and then it blows the fuck up. Yeah. Kind of in the underground, but it's bigger than the underground it was. Well, he told me a story the other day. And he goes, I don't know if you remember it, but he seen me at a gig and I was playing pool and he asked me for one of my CDs and I had one left. I gave it to him. So he's like, in his words, he was a fan of my, my music. Like he'd heard about me. He, my mixtape had somehow, I was like driving around giving out mixtapes. It was, it was CDs, it was nothing, it was no streaming, no digital shit. And somehow my mixtapes were getting to these housing commission areas that his mates were listening to him. His, in his words, he's like, my mates were going out and doing robberies to your shit and da 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 da. So when I actually met, we, we crossed paths a few times and then Torture actually said, bro, there's this guy, Cursor. He's like, he's gonna, like, he's, he's got it, he's got it. You know what I mean? So I was like, he ended up recording at this place called Electric Sun. So he'd be in one room with one engineer and I was working on maybe my album or whatever mixtape I was working on at the time. And we met and we just like, we'd end up going upstairs and getting drunk and fucking freestyling for like four or five hours and just, just having fun with it. Like with, there's very little footage from that time. We did record shit, but there's like, there's like one clip online. It says 3 a.m. haggard freestyle or something. And you can see a young curse and you can see me and rates. And we just, we just, we just kicked it off. And it was hard to find, because doing what my style of music, there wasn't a lot of people along those lines. And though I wouldn't say curse is exactly like what I do, we will, we close enough where we could work together and work on songs. So, um, you know, he was out coming out with a smart ass shit and like, you know, but being from Campbelltown and me being from Blacktown, those places are almost identical, like the social issues and all that shit. So we found a common ground and we just both really, I'll say we both really loved the music that much. That's why we, be, we became good friends. Like we've always, been about the music and then it's like you go to any workplace if hopefully there's someone that you get along with at that workplace and it makes your job a lot more enjoyable and 
seeing him, he took me on his first tour and I just watched his, it just went boom, boom. And to this day, like in the last, even the last tour he did, hitting new heights again. So it's like, I've seen, I've seen him go through this whole thing. It's pretty amazing, eh? Like seeing, being there from the start and seeing where it's at now. Cause he was actually like, he's a pioneer, no doubt. You know what I mean? So. But you, you're, yeah, you and the guys you talked about before were the yeah. pioneers that, like the ones before it started and influenced him to then go and do his yeah. thing. But even then he's a pioneer for all the guys that started now. So it's almost like a gen three. Yeah. With, with that, right, with that, you guys are doing your shows. And I know you recently did a thing called Band in New South Wales, but yeah. that's been an issue that you face forever. You're starting out, you're starting to do these tours with Curse, you're mm. starting to do build an Australian audience, you're doing tours and shows yourself. Mm. I know there was a lot of backlash from, you know, the uh, venues, but also the police and whatnot. Like, yeah. ha- what was the challenges back then? I know we're seeing it massively Ooh. now with the 1 4 being banned. You guys have been banned yeah. at times, but ha- how was that when you first the, started the out? The first real challenges was fucking the graffiti artists, because they'd come to the venues and they'd bomb the fuck out of the fucking venues, and no venue would want you. They'd be like, oh, there's free grand damage. And with the graffiti, the graffiti artists back then, there was a lot of stabbings, a lot of bottle, bottlings, a lot of fucking. There was like, they were the bad cunts really in the in the scene. So like that was really a challenge. And venues were just knocking us back. Like, oh, they'd hear about this, and that, I'm literally the the shows would finish, and there'd be twenty cunts out the front punching on, stabbing, running across the fucking the intersections and. Yeah, and plus the toilets have been bombed the shit out of this. So that was the, really the biggest challenge. It wasn't really, I guess they, they were gangs. I guess they were gangs, they were crews and shit, but that was really it to, for a long time until we sort of got a bit bigger where we could regulate things and just, you know, f- finally maybe find venues that were a bit more, it was all about building relationships. So all the venues I work with today I can like ring them up and speak to them. Like, cause if they just go off a Google search, they're gonna have a completely different idea sure, yeah. or, or listen to the music. Well, this guy's a fucking maniac, but like people like Dave from Laundry Bar, we've got a great relationship. He'll welcome us through any time. And a lot of these venues, we've, we've just found where we fit in a bit more. There's some venues that you can bomb the fuck out of it these days and they don't care. So, you know, that was, yeah. But with the police, that was a whole different thing brought in by the new generation because all the postcode wars. So basically when that kid got stabbed at the Easter show, they, 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 everything's postcode this, postcode that. Um, they put a task force and they allocated a whole bunch of money to solving this. Like we're just gonna throw some money at it and how are we gonna uh, attack this? So really it's only New South Wales that, that legislation, or, I don't even think there's legislation. I think it's just the fucking task force. Yep. And they, um, so they stopped one for all uh, for a certain period of time and other artists. And then somehow my name got in this list. I think they just knocked off all the top guys and then slowly worked their way down and started giving us problems and made us pay, either pay for them to be at these shows or just made it so hard that we didn't want to do them. So that's why I just went, fuck it, let's, do a t- let's just do a fucking tour and call a band from New South Wales and we'll go everywhere. So when people go, where's the Sydney show? The fucking, it's in the title, so we used it and it worked for us. Yeah, no shit. It was pretty successful. So, so but when you were like but prior to that task force going nuts, you know, yeah. like, and the thing is, what's quite crazy, and I know you and I know this, but like the problems of the targeting have been around for fucking thirty years. Yeah, like people from postcodes have been punching on for as long yeah. as there's been people in fucking postcodes, right? Yeah. But what when you were doing this stuff at the start and it was mania, people were getting bottle stabbed, like they were yeah. bombing the toilets. Were you having trouble with the police, or they didn't weren't paying attention? No, to so it? it didn't really come into effect until. People, the, the rappers had jail history or gang affiliations because now you've got the Raptor Squad, which is a gang squad, looking at basically gang members that rap. So that's when it started to get like that. But at the start, it was like, it was, it was more bikies than that around. We used to do shows at bikey clubhouses and stuff like that. And this was before Raptor and all that. And we used to, used to run a mark, like, but pretty wild times. Like, um, but it wasn't really like targeted. It yeah, was more uh, reactive than proactive. Yeah. Yeah. Did, were you trying to keep it under the radar, like when you did shows from them? Oh, not really. Not really. Yeah. Like, because I don't, I think they just, I think we were, I don't know how the fuck I flew under their radar. Neither. Like, like, yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I just think, uh, I don't know, luck or just, it just, I'm sure they heard rumblings, but it never, look, it, it's like I said, it comes down to when you've got, jail 
affiliations and gang affiliations that then they can actually take these gang Stamps. task force towards you. Yeah. And me personally, I've got a lot of intel, but I don't have a lot of convictions. Getcha. So, yeah. Yeah, it's like an interesting one because like the first time I actually even heard about this style of music, yourself included, and mm. I kind of got into it, was there was a, a venue because I grew out sort of like out of a southeast. Yeah. And there was a venue in a place called the Middle and French Gully, and Kirsten mm. played there. Yeah. And there was a shooting because these guys from fucking French Gully, which is a commissionary mm. back then, mm. obviously had dramas with them. I don't. Were you at that show? I, th I think I heard of it. They shot like the second story or something. Yeah. Like, yeah. I and don't then, think I was there. No. Yeah. So it was in the paper, and there was yeah. all this drama, and I was like, "What is this?" And then again, same as what you said, like I started listening to that sort of style of music mm. and I'm like, oh, this reminds me more of how I'm growing up and living yeah. than fucking the guys from Adelaide Hills, yeah? And so yeah. obviously when you're first starting out, you, yeah. you know, you can't put stuff on SoundCloud. You can't go on TikTok to blow shit up. Yeah. Like you talked about before going around and giving CDs and stuff. Yeah. Like how, how were you promoting your music back then? Stickers and CDs and just word of mouth. I just, everywhere I'd go, I'd be slamming up stickers. Like uh, people probably, some people probably remember I used to have this knuckle duster emblem and Forte and I'd just be going. There used to be toll booths on the M4 and you had to like actually put the change in and I was running up and down to the city three, four times a day, slap one on the way up, slap one on the way back and this was just like street promotion. Um, that, MySpace was a th was the first thing where you could actually put your, your songs and videos and all that and then I, I started to get really popular on MySpace and just as I was, that I was like hitting, a, I was probably one of the top artists for that genre and then Facebook came and I was like fuck Facebook like I'm not I'm not I don't want to start not something new and then I just watched all these other artists and I was about six months eight months behind that I was like fuck now I've got to go to Facebook yeah yeah and the same thing happened when Instagram came along I'm like you got your, your Facebook build up ah fuck Instagram oh, no. you, and then the Snapchat now that's TikTok so you just got to move with the times but like to answer your question in the early days word of mouth literally driving around giving out CDs stickers fucking yeah it's just it's spread somehow like you reckon people just burn them and just like hand yeah, them out to others yeah was, was, like i used to just non-stop burn and on a friday saturday night drive around i might i have my mate i might be drinking or something pull up at train stations yeah give it the, like it was really like yeah organic hand to hand yeah. that's mad yeah what gave you um the, the skill set to learn how to like become a hustler like that for your music <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I should answer that, but um, <laughs> let's, let's just say hand-to-hand -hand sales. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no comment, officer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I had to do it. There's um, yeah. So and the other one was like when you're recording, right? Like now yeah. it's easy as fuck. You go to a studio, you record. Yeah. How were you doing it back then? Like there was no scene for hip hop uh, or rap. Well, it was really tough. Uh, home studios were really rare um, to have a setup. So I was just lucky enough. I'd always find engineers and corrupt them. Like I uh, just you know. Like, there's, I've told this story before, but like, there was this one engineer, you know, he used to like, you know, do you remember bass? Yeah. Yeah, so like, this is the days of bass. You give him like fucking half a gram of bass and this kind of, we stay up for two days and recording and, you know, his dad owned a studio and when they, and they used to charge like 80 bucks an hour. So it was just to record, which was a lot for back then. So if we're doing, we're doing 10 hour sessions and this, that, and we're, we're just recording for what, what would it cost? Maybe 150 bucks for that shit. This can't be off his nut for two days and we're just fucking like, and I, I've, I've found a couple places like that. So it was just, and then slowly um, home studios became a bit more popular and you just have your like M box, a decent mic and a lot of the stuff, the mixtapes, cause I just did, I've done a shitload of mixtapes. Um, they were mainly done in home studios. So yeah, no shit. now these days you could fucking go to JB Hi-Fi and walk out with a fucking whole setup and for fucking probably under a thousand bucks. But back in the day, it wasn't as attainable and, and to have the knowledge of how to work the programs as well. I've never worked a program in my life. Like I just I just do what I do and let someone else do, that knows what they're doing do that shit. It's kind of crazy because I remember when it like first started out, you know, it was sort of home studios or whatever. Then it got mm. real technical where it was like these massive production joints with windows and fucking mixes. And now it's gone back again. Like some of yeah. these guys are making like one four HP boys. I actually saw HP boys set up when they did the blueprint. Yeah. And it was just a mattress in a, in a garage. Yeah. 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 And they, the, I think they did engineers on that too. Yeah. And yeah. So it kind of went full swing, went backwards again. Yeah. Um, so the other one too is like, what's the difference that you sort of would say between, you know, when you were doing stuff and making music to now with these new guys that are blown up? 
Um, what the t the way you record or no? I'm also just like, um, in what way is it like the challenges that you had that they don't really have now, or vice versa, um, or just the difference in scenes? Uh, what the, the challenges they have is just well, I guess it's the police. Yeah, really. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if you know, I, I actually put HP boys on their first show. Um, no shit, no, I didn't know that. Yeah, it was um. I think it was at Chelsea Heights or somewhere, but um, oh yeah, I remember it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they 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 only had three songs. That was yeah, that was like like days after Blueprint. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So like uh, someone got in contact, and I got on. I, I watched their film clip. I remember I was in Bondi Meriton. I was watching. Like, oh, this is pretty cool. They're talking about a few things, you know. And then they came down with like I don't know, 20, 30 boys jumped on stage and they, had, they only had three songs, and they did it. Those three songs about three times each. The whole stage was shaking and. That, that was funny because Spanion was actually supposed to perform at that show too. He, yeah, wow. There's a flyer. I'll get you the flyer. It says Spanion, Spinner, who he was rapping with or affiliated with, HP Boys, Husky, myself, Curve, that kid Curve. And um, yeah, that was a... I, I full remember that show now. Like yeah. I actually do. And I remember there was like, that was like the first time I'd seen like 50 dudes on a stage. And it was yeah. like, it was at that point, that, well, when they were playing, there was almost like, you couldn't have fit more people on that well, stage. Well, there's more people on stage than in the crowd. Yeah, I was going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like pretty it was, it was a cool night i remember like just everyone hanging out we were smoking weed drinking and uh, to these to this day i'm still in touch with them with the hp boys and they i'm um, really um admire their success you know what i mean they've stuck to it and they've created their own lane you know yeah, 100%. So. and that was like what back then because like that you guys were doing sort of like it was more kind of like anglo kind of gutter commission Ooh. kind of rap in a sense yeah they were one of the first two uh, sort of islander groups that blew up. Yeah. Um, and then it never really merged together. Like, why do you reckon that they're sort of the islander or poly stuff and their their stuff beforehand, like, you know, Husky yourself, chilling yeah. out, all that shit. How come you reckon it hasn't fully just combined together? Because they're two different uh, audiences. Well, to be honest with you, I think that people think there's more gatekeepers in this shit than there actually is. So I think that, like, now the polys have got their run, they're running with it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so... I'm not saying that there won't be collabor collaborations that happen, but I feel like maybe now that they've just, I feel like it's just been in the last five years that they've got their run. They're like, it, it's sort of how we feel. I don't, I can't speak for everyone, right? But it's sort of how we feel, we felt about the major labels when we came in the game. We're like, these guys are getting exposure and this, that, and then we found a way to get through. So, but saying that, a lot of them stick to themselves. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, true. Not, it's not that there's, there's any reason for it uh, you might see some collaborations in the future with but uh, i think they're overdue but um it'll come with time and it comes with friendships and but even because even the audiences don't mix because i go to these rap shows right 100%. so it's like i'll go to like the poly boy stuff and then i'll go to like you know your stuff yeah. and they're two different fucking audiences yeah, they're not even yeah. similar yeah no 100 percent. so you get the more r&b crowd would i say i don't yeah. know the more i don't know would you but then you come to our show and you got all the houses and the crackheads and be Mental patience. <laughs> <laughs> because of that, right? Do you have some crazy, like, oh, crazy show story that just fucking got out of control that you can tell us about? Oh, let me have a think. Oh, okay, yeah. There was this one show. It was called The Wild West, and they had it at St. Mary's, and it just turned to chaos. It was like hijack and torture. Pretty sure Death Wish cast were there. Myself, Two Loco, uh, and what would this be? Maybe. Pretty sure Cursor performed there too. This was in his early days. Schemo. And uh, yeah, Sydney Searchers, they were a thing then. Um, it was probably 2007, 2008. And this place just, I don't know what, the, it was at the Lucky Australian. It, they don't know what hit it. It was like, this was when there was still a lot of graphers there. I just remember seeing cunts running around, running around with samurai swords, people getting tased in the car park. That was when I realized there was two police helicopters. The whole time I thought there was only one. <laughs> Um, people, this one, it started when this one cunt kept getting kicked out and he'd come back around and jump this colour bomb fence and then it seemed like security were occupied with that and something would kick off on that and this would turn it into a full-blown riot but yeah, I just remember cunts running around with fucking hammers, samurai swords so I remember someone getting tased in the car park and um, yeah, it was definitely the Wild West <laughs> <laughs> Lived up to the name yeah, it definitely did and I'm sure that they haven't had a hip-hop event there since but yeah, yeah you know. so then after that you've worked you talk about the ogs right so some mm. of those names you threw out are like the actual fucking ogs yeah then you've worked up with guys like take care kid curve yeah. you know, hp boys chilling out all these guys yeah. 
Um, what sort of, how did you kind of create those relationships? And because you've done a real good job of sort of staying in with both, right? Like yeah. with both audiences. A lot of those other guys haven't fallen off, but yeah. they've just sort of, you know, faded away or moved mm -hmm. on with their life. But you've sort of been a part of all the ways. I, how did you do that? I think it's because what I do behind the scenes a bit more. Like, um, I'm, I'm independent. I've never been signed to a label. Everything I've done from my distribution to my promotions to putting on shows and just knowing the business. So when I meet a lot of these guys, I'm a bit more savvy to these things. So And I like to share. I'm not like a, I'm not someone that tries to make money off people. And if I can offer a service and you can, we can work together, let's work. And most of the time I'm just good at net, bringing people together. And like I said from the start, I never liked to be on stage by myself. So. Me, TKO, and that, that kid Curve did an album together, and I don't think there's three Aussie rappers, the uh, solo artists that have ever done an album like that. It's one of, I think it's, if not the most successful album we've all done, um, it'd be if not the second, or close to it. And I think more artists should be like that. So like the chilling it situation. I just met him at a certain time when he was like, you know, there was there was things I could show him, and then in return, I found myself working with him a bit more, doing tour management. And it's just offering, you know, like, I don't, I'm not here to take advantage. Like, we're just, um, we're in the same industry and I'm, I'm like open book with the people that I like, to, that I get along with. I'm not gonna bullshit them. And if I can show you uh, what it took me fucking 10 years to learn in 10 minutes, then why not? And I think that's why a lot of my relationships in hip hop have been established and continue from that. Because when I met you, it was backstage at Chilling It at the fucking, was buying the Palais, it was the outdoor festival thing they yeah. did. I think it was like, you did two shows with 6,000 people. Yeah. Were you TM and then? Yeah. 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 I was like the dirty tour manager. I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't like, and sometimes um, there's booklets or they'd put me down as security and I didn't really, but I wouldn't, I'll just say I was a jack of all trades. I was just, I, one thing I did learn over the years is like, how to get in the venues, how to get out, how to maneuver, how to like, you know, do or get certain things the artist requires and avoid the things that they don't need. And that's what I was gonna go into that. So like, yeah. I remember on that situation, you sort of were doing that that night yeah. um, because that was your job. Like not, it was almost like making sure shit didn't happen that didn't need to happen. Yeah. In that rap scene, yeah, that, that's one of the things that's interesting and I've worked in, in it too, but like there's times where I've done shows where I've had to fucking, people have actually threatened that they're gonna come and shoot someone. Yeah. So then we've had to do what you just spoke about, had to yeah. figure out how to get someone through a back door, how we're gonna make it not obvious they're coming, who knows what time they're coming and shit. Yeah. What, why do you think that that in the Oz hip hop scene, like, you know, I doubt Hilltop Hoods and Bliss and Esso are worried about which door <laughs> and entry they're coming through. <laughs> yeah. So why do you think in that scene, like there is this thing where most of the time it's like rap crews versus rap crews. Like, why do you think it can be so fucking well, scary? That, well, cause the industry or the, the industry heads, like the, the label heads, they don't know how to handle that. They don't know. They're gonna call the police or they're gonna hire security. And sometimes hiring security isn't the right solution because it creates confrontation. You don't know who you're dealing with. So like that show you were talking about, we were, there was actually a threat on him for that show. Yeah, I remember. And we had a couple of boys and just people, you know, that I know from, you know, back home and that know how to handle these situations. and. It, it's sort of having those people there sort of avoids the confrontation. Like, I remember you you calling around, you like kind of figuring out intel, saying how bad it was, and yeah, right, right, put my feelers out. And how do you tell stuff. someone from Sony Music like, hey, you know, there might be this issue? Yeah, they don't want to. They just wig the it. fuck out and, and, and they'll catch the show. That's where I found I my groove really. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's like, like what's just, our what's the word negotiator? Yeah, it's like you know, <laughs> hip hop negotiator. Yeah, I don't know the exact job title, but it's like yeah, it's it's just just being a bit more streetwise to what's going on. And cause you're an older, I feel as though like most people respect you and look up to you, right? Yeah. But with these younger crews, they're arguing online flat out. They're, on st they're constantly, they punch on at gigs. They do all yeah. this sort of shit. Why do you think that they seem to not get along compared to like other genres of music? Uh, it's like rap's always competitive. Like it's always like people always trying to be number one. Number, but now you've got all this crew element, the gang element, the postcode shit, which has been blown out of proportion. Like when I started, I represented Western Sydney. Now Western Sydney is divided, mm. you know, and you've got these guys are from this area, these guys are from this area, and they're only like next door to each other, which is, I find stupid because we should all be working together, but what can you do? It's not just music politics, it goes to jail politics and the street politics, and it's all, you know, this, gangster rap that didn't exist is now 
I guess, I don't want to label it gangster rap, but that's, there is much more of a criminal, criminal element to it that is authentic and very visible than it was in the, when I started. And real is a good term. Like yeah. when we're doing shows and I, again, goes back to these guys who hit me up, like I'd, I'd call them like, you can't have these two guys in line. Yeah. And like, if you do, yeah. this is going to cause dramas. Yeah. I fucking made the mistake myself where I booked guys and got told it was going to be okay and there's been yeah. punch on Jen. So yeah. it's like, it is real. Like these, the threats and stuff you see that happen, it fucking does happen. Yeah, I'd, I'd say most of it isn't even music related. Yeah. It's just like someone's crew, there might be one guy in this crew, he's got a problem with one guy in this crew. They might not even be the artist. They might just be the, you know, the sidekicks or whatever. But, you know, it's, um, but there's also the element of, competition but i don't think that's the reason there's violence yeah i reckon you're right like every time we had incidents it wasn't the artist yeah, yeah. Like, oh it might have been but it was to do with some fucking other thing that was external not music yeah and now everyone's running with crews and this fucking screaming gang gang and fucking <laughs> i guess it's just what it is but you yeah know. so when you first came up right you had you supported some fucking ridiculously massive artists can yeah. you touch on some of the guys you how you got those gigs oh yeah well i i found myself sneaking back to these Sneaking backstage, like one day there was Method Man and Red Man. I, they, like I loved them. I was, to this day, they're like one of my early influences. And I just said to these boys, I'm like, I'm gonna get backstage tonight. And everyone's laughing at me. I said, no, I'm gonna get fucking backstage. And, and I just didn't stop. And I seen someone and he was hosting and I knew him. I was like, well, give me your pass. And he put it in his hat and he put it over the thing. I put it on, I got backstage, had a bag of weed. I found DJ Premier. I ended up backstage with him. I go, you need some weed? Yeah, sweet, you guys can come in. So. Weed was basically, was, let's say weed helped, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it was a, a lot of American artists needed it. It wasn't as accessible. Now you got your medical, you got your Cali, but it was like they'd come to town and 90% of these promoters wouldn't organize it. These days it's a bit different. They do. Yeah. That's like something that no one talks about. But like even we get like, you know, someone land, they're like, can you get X, Y, Z? You've got to make it sure. That's one of those things I'm sort of out of myself a little bit, but I can, but it was a part of the job. You had to go yeah. find what they needed, yeah? So, so I ended up getting backstage enough where I started to meet promoters and I started to be commonplace in these backstages where people actually thought I was some, like I was meant to be there. And then I built relationships off that. And then like I supported people like Ice Cube. We did that at Luna Park. That was like 5,000 people. I was massive at the time. Um, Bone Fogs, which I got to hang out with several times. Um, oh, right, the list goes on. We got to work with Snoop, hang around them. They did the big day out. Cursor was on the big day out. So I, was, I had him and I had Snoop's contacts. And man, there was like three, four times I've been on tours with them. Um, oh, I can't, like there's a lot in the early days. There was a lot. I'm just... Oh. But uniquely, like, these guys currently, they don't really get those opportunities. And I feel like when it comes to anybody, like, no one's supported bigger American artists than really you, like the OGs. Yeah, and and being at the level I was at, I wasn't even a big artist. It was more my negotiating and my networking that got me in there. You know what I mean? Like, these days, to really support any artist of that caliber, you need to really have some numbers. Or be with an agency or some shit. Yeah. yeah. So I was, I was, I was blessed. The, the thing that I'm, like, very happy about when I started rap, a lot of the artists that I looked up to or listened to, I either got to meet, work with, or just be backstage or support. So it was like a lot of bucket list shit, you know what I mean? So I really, I, I did not start rap thinking, I'm gonna make a career out of this. I don't know what the fuck I was thinking. It's, I guess in some way I was hoping I could, but there was no proven career path. So yeah, no one was, had done it yet. Yeah, just, just to be like, I'm doing a show tonight, for fuck's sake. I mean, I've been in the game 20 years. Like, yeah. it's fucking, it trips me out. Like, and so when, like, when you were supporting those dudes, like, I, could you ever imagine when you were fucking 15 in Blacktown that you were gonna meet Snoop Dogg and shit? Never, like, never. Like yeah. if, I was that, if I was 15 and you came to me and you said, oi, you're gonna fucking smoke weed with Snoop Dogg or you're gonna fucking hang out. I, man, it was so far away from what I could believe, but like listening to these artists, like these American artists and just playing, skipping school, playing PlayStation, smoking weed and just, it was a world away. Yeah. You know what I mean? And when it, that shit happened, it really like motivated me. Like, I don't know, I don't know. I guess it's happened for a reason, but it's, um, it just pushed me to like, the, the world's like, it's the, you can really like the law of attraction or like if you really like, when I said, I'm getting backstage tonight, having that attitude towards anything in life, 
I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna. I'm gonna be great. I'm gonna be like you. Really have to believe, believe it. it. You know what I mean? It's crazy, eh? Because like you're sitting there, 15, 16, smoking weed, playing video games. You're like, fuck, I'd love to meet Snoop Dogg, and you made it happen. Yeah, like. But it's true. Like a lot of the guys I talk to uh, every week, and myself mm. too. That was the shit that I was thinking, and yeah. the same things. I've got the same yarns where I've met these famous people. I'm like, how? Yeah, and like. Yeah. But it's, it is true. It's like that law of attraction. Like if you believe that it possibly, not even that it's gonna happen, that it possibly could happen, yeah. it's a chance that it can happen. Like I ended up at Easy E's parents' house, like in Compton, and I was like, "Fuck!" I used to wake up and go to before go to school and listen to Easy religiously, like, and just uh, he's his uh, son's in uh, town tomorrow. He's got a show, so I'm gonna catch up with him. And he's a friend of mine now, so like he's fucking the same age as me, and it's. Uh, it's like it spins me out, trips me out. What's some of the interactions you have with these massive guys? Well, um, just smoking, hanging out, just with uh, who? Like Snoop Dogg? Snoop, you, yeah. Legit I, hanging out and smoking weed with Snoop Dogg. Well, I'll be honest. I wasn't smoking weed when he was there, but I helped him facilitate the smoking of the weed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that was enough for me. You know what I mean? I think that's most people's bucket list. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I'd like, I could take either or, but yeah. I, I had the opportunity to, but I was, um, I was cool. But, um, that was a long, like I've got this thing called behind the music. It's a little segment I do. And I tell the whole backstory on how that Snoop collab happened. Yeah. And that wasn't easy. That was a process of, this shit that I'm telling you, getting backstage and getting these passes and getting the hitting, like, yeah. But it, in the end, it came through, and I was, I couldn't believe it. Like, I remember we did it at the, um, the Hyatt Hyatt in the Park, I think, um, near Hyde Park, this yeah, hotel. Yeah, no, yeah. And I just remember driving home, and the sunrise was coming up, and I was just like, if this shit doesn't put me on the map, I don't know what the fuck. Like, but ultimately, it didn't make my career. It looks yep. good on paper. It's a great story to tell, but it's it, it ain't the song that took me out of here. Like yeah, because this is the club you're talking about, right? Yeah, so like, you could touch on that a little bit. Yeah, well, um, that was just yeah done in the hotel. It was after uh, he did Superfest. I went back to I went back to the hotel, and they're like, "Oh, we're gonna take you up to see Snoop." We picked the beat first, and then they took him up to the presidential suite. I get up there. And he's a big bodyguard like this. He's got his own little sort of room inside the room. And they go, Snoop's asleep. I'm like, oh, okay. So we were fucking, I took Daz Dillinger, which I already had a song with. And we went around King's Cross. This is King Cross in its prime. And we shot a film clip for a song that we had on my previous album. So we did that and we got back. Snoop's still asleep. I'm like, fuck. Then he fucking, we're just sitting there. I'm like, this is a massive fucking presidential suite. It's massive. So I'm just... Just sitting there waiting. I'm not. You know, I want to want to wake the cunt up, but I'm like, you're not gonna fucking bother Snoop. So finally, he wakes up. He walks out, scratching his head, looks at me, turns around, goes back to the room, goes back to sleep for another two hours. I'm like, all right. Daz is in the corner, just waiting. His DJ's like half asleep. Finally, he gets up. He comes. He fucking. He goes, oh, show me the beat. Puts the beat on. He goes, you pick this. I'm like, yeah. Well, before that, I met him at Star City. And like the actual, he goes, this is all he said to me. He goes, uh, the DJ introduced me. He goes, this is Forte. He looks after us when we're in Sydney. We're going to do a song with him. And he, Snoop just looked at me and said, you got your shit, you got your shit together? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and that was it. He goes, all right. Well, that was, the, that was the agreement. So then going back to the hotel, yeah, he finally got up. He had a Blackberry. He's just sitting there. And this is like, it must be like 4.30 in the morning by this time. I'm like, and then he goes, all right, I'm ready. And he got up, dropped it in one take, fucking did his ad libs, and that was it. And I just chilled for a bit. The sun came up. They had a flight to catch that day, and it's just listening. I was just like a fly on the wall. I didn't, you know, I wasn't outgoing. I wasn't, you know, I was just fucking just listening. And I, he was talking about his family, and all, got got a bit of an insight to see who he was as a person. And um, yeah, and then I just remember driving home, and the sun right, the sun was up, and I'm like, shit, I did it. That's a spin out, man. Doing a song with Snoop Dogg, it's so yeah, mad. I know, and like even to, like he's not any smaller than he was then. Like yeah, he's this was just before he became Snoop Lion. This was 2011. Yep. So um yeah, that was that was a great achievement. You know what I mean? So I yeah, think definitely. There's not many bigger rappers. He's probably the most famous rapper in the world. Yeah. Is there anyone else in Australia who's done something with him? Jessica Malboy. Yeah, really. Yeah, she did it, but she was with a label. I'm sure she's paid out the ass. So nobody's done it independently like you did? No. Nah. That's a fucking wild yarn, man. Nah, yeah, it was a, 
I was, I was very but lucky. Who else have you clubbed with? Because you clubbed some other massive artists too, right? Um, so I've done uh, Crazy Bone, Lazy Bone. Uh, I've got a song with Hobson. Uh, who else? Uh, Daz Dillinger, Corrupt. Uh, fuck. Who else? A couple of uh, Dizzy Roy, uh, Jared Benton. Uh, a couple of artists. But Plus, like, every massive fucking Aussie rapper in the last 10 years. Yeah, and I've, I've got probably more... Well, I've got more collabs with Cursor than fucking anyone. You yeah, know what no I mean? shit. And he doesn't really work with many people, so that's um, that's always been a good working relationship. We, I like, I enjoy doing songs with him. Like, we bring the bring the best out of each other. How many albums have you done? Some crazy amount, right? I'm about to drop my 17th album next month. Crazy. Yeah. So the show you're doing tonight, you're doing it with Enter, who's another OG from back in the day. Yeah. So he was he before or after you? He was probably just a, like a year or two after me, probably, yeah. He was young. Sydney. They, so they used to be in a crew called Sydney Searchers, Sky High, Schemo and him. And they were, they had the, the all the graffiti artists, like, they, you know, because they were from the city ways. I was from the west. And I used to travel out and sometimes go to their area. I was like the only one that would really go to those areas and see how they were, how they, they'd interact. They'd always have, be having fights in the backyard and wild shit. Like the graffiti cunts were a bit more wild. The people out west seemed to stick together. Like we'd fight other people, not each other. But they, yeah, they, they, But they seemed to just want to fight each other. Like every time <laughs> they did something. So I was like, I, it was good to see. And like I got to, yeah, I floated around a lot. And yeah, we're, we're all good friends. Was, you know, I not in touch with him like I used to be. Like Anto, obviously, we were doing shows together. But yes, the early days of Schemo, he he's even used to DJ for Cursor at one point. And um, Sky High was for a uh, way ahead of her time for a female rapper. And it's a shame that she didn't um, continue to do her, what she did was doing. But you know, uh, there's a lot of history there people might not know about. A lot of really good songs if you want to dig for them. And yeah. So you were so you were working with them like back back in the day, yeah. and still are today. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah was, that's crazy. Do you reckon Sky High ever comes back? I haven't heard from her in years. I don't think so, to be honest. I don't know. Like you know, Hayden from Take Flight. He just took a photo with her at some gig like three days ago. Oh, did he? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. I haven't I haven't had contact with her in years. I bumped into her brother and stuff like that. But like the stuff like we, me and her used to just go to studios and just fucking. She was like another one that would like. Certain people like still sharpen steel sort of thing. We used to like, yeah, we we did some pretty good songs together. But she was like for a girl, not even just for a girl, even to today. Like, is there a female rapper today that like? I know I know there's names out there, but there's like not, iconic, not like her. Like, yeah, you know, she was like she really bout it. You know what I mean? Like, is there any upcoming artist to keep an eye on that you're looking at or working with that you think is the next fucking wave? <sighs> Not, not really. No, I don't really pay attention to, like, if it pops up, it pops up. But I don't really, like, go looking for talent or nothing like that. I'm just, like, if it comes around my circumference, like, you know, there'll be certain people. Like, like shout out to Ribby. Ribby's on tour with us. He's, like, um, you know, I'd say he's, you know, he's establishing himself more. I see some potential there. But um, I see different shit, but, like, I'm not really scoping for people like that if it, if it pops up and the song's good the song's good but like yeah no one in particular really so what do you reckon the future of aussie hip-hop looks like you know 2018 all this sort of uh oh. drill or gutter rap blows up it's it's massive it's humongous now yeah. there's gone from having like five artists to fucking 500 artists not really but you know what i mean yeah what do you reckon the next 10 years look like for hip-hop i think it'll go for a cycle of drill drill will play out in the form of a lot of people are going to end up losing friends to it uh whether to the grave or to jail. And I think, I don't see people being 40 years old still thinking drill's cool that come from that era. So I think that will play its course. It will always be there, but I think people, I think it might become a bit more conscious or it might it might turn back to us, like the shit that we're doing, get us getting the second run. As you see, like a lot of artists in America that are from the 90s are still, you know, as long as you can reinvent yourself, 
Um, besides that, I don't know. I might just go into some weird shit. I don't know. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, Become Forte Lion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Forte been lying a long time. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah. Um, and then the, probably the final question before I finish mm. up today, because I know you're busy and I've, we've got to do some stuff too. This gutter rap and drill rap stuff, right? Like obviously in the media currently every day you're watching how they're saying it's influencing these crime and the crime rate, rate is rising and rah, rah. Do you think it's bullshit or do you think it actually is playing a part and making it worse? Um, yeah, to a certain extent, just to the young minds, because it's actually like crime's been around since before fucking rap existed. So now that people are making it cool, like this fucking sh sh stabbing shit, like I grew up on gangster rap, it was bang, bang. Now it's fucking shiv, shiv, like fucking. So back in my day, it was easy to get a gun and cheaper than it is now. But you can get your fucking, you can go get a knife from the kitchen drawer and be 12 years old. And like, when I was listening to EZE and he was talking about Uzis, I couldn't go to the fucking kitchen drawer and grab a Uzi. So, but these impressionable minds, which are usually dumb cunts anyway, like if you can listen to it and take, doesn't mean you're gonna, it's gonna turn you out. You have to have something wrong with you, unstable. But these kids are getting off on like, oh, how, what, you shanked three people, he shanked five. Oh, da, 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 da. It's starting to become a, a scores, like they say, taking scores. So like, I think it's influencing the dumb cunts that we're gonna be dumb cunts anyway. Yeah, perfect. You know what I mean? so. Yeah, I rate that how you saw talking about how it's more accessible, you're right. Like they were talking about all this stuff that it was like a like a world apart, yeah? And like yeah. now you're right. Like most songs is a bit talking about shanking someone yeah. and anyone can get access to it. We yeah. can get one in two minutes from here yeah, now. Or fucking scissors or fucking anything, you know what I mean? But like the, sh it, the shanking has become like a, a fashionable, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, so you reckon the violence is worse now or? or? Uh, I just, uh, no, not really. I Neither. think it's all, I think violence is always violence. I think. Different. Yeah. Yeah, because like even when we were growing up, it was like you know people getting bottled. They would get like all that shit was still happening. It was just different forms yeah. of doing it. I just think now that you've got more kids carrying weapons, whether they whether it's for protection or they're going to use them, or they just get in a situation where a brawl starts and they just do something stupid, and next thing they fucking stab some cunt. But I think that's just the more because I can see these kids like you see them and like you can tell the ones that are carrying they sort of like. They're not like, you might walk down the street, they don't care how big you are, like, because they know they got a fucking, probably a knife on them like this, but that's the only issue. I think it's more childish crimes. Getcha. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess if it's more accessible, it's more likely to happen. Yeah. So yeah. Hopefully, hopefully everyone, you know. Calms down. Yeah. Man, thank you for coming. Today, before, before I finish up, I've got to quickly do my sponsor stuff. Sure. Because I keep the lights on, so. WP Shots and Sour Puss available at Liquorland and First Choice Liquor around the country and Good Independence. It's still your label. Owned by Promoter Boys from Melbourne. Wicked quality. If you don't believe me, buy it. If you don't like it, I will give you your money back. I'll send you some of these t-shirts. They're mad. Sounds and good. then last but not least, AAA Digital. If you're looking to enhance your hospitality event or festival uh, brand, he's the man to talk to, old mate Carlo P. And he 100% would do it. He's tried and tested. For, thanks for coming down, bro. I thanks know you're only in Melbourne me. for a couple of days. I really appreciate it. The weather's been fucked. Hopefully mm. you smack it tonight with all the boys. And yep. I look forward to... Continue to watch what you do, bro. I uh, appreciate it. And likewise, um, congratulations with your success. And I'm looking forward to see your future content. Thanks, bro. I love it.